Welcome to episode 34 of New Tech People. Today we have Cheryl Gladhill, head of product at Blue Chili. Welcome, Cheryl. Thank you. Uh, Cheryl, give us a quick overview for the people that don't know you in the Newcastle tech community. Who are you? What have you been doing? Uh, so I moved to Newcastle three years ago. Um, I work for a company called Blue Chili. Um, so I'm head of product down there. Um, and so we were a, a technical accelerator. So um, our theory was that there's already a lot of accelerators out there for like young guys that code all night in hoodies. Um, our kind of niche was non-technical founders. Um, we figured if someone is a subject matter expert and they see a problem that they want to solve, but they don't necessarily have the technical know-how, could we come in for six months, be their technical co-founder, um, have access to a product team, so product managers, um, UX designers and developers, mm -hmm. and could we take them to kind of the MVP of their product um, within a six-month period? Awesome. So, yeah. You did that day, obviously based out of Sydney. You mm -hmm. work remotely, you work down there? Yeah, remotely. So they're actually a really, really great company. Um, and it was interesting because my first interview with Claudia, the head of people, um, wasn't so much about my work history, but it was about like my life outside of work and what drove me and how do I like to work and how am I motivated? Um, and her theory is that people use work as an excuse to not do what they should be doing. And she's like, if you want to write a book, work's not stopping you. You pick your hours, you work when you have like the best creative metabolism, if that's from home, if that's at 10 o'clock at night, like you just get the best out of you and that's your responsibility. Um, so I was fully remote, but I did choose to go down there one day a week just because I love being in the office. Yeah. So. That's a really refreshing way to look at hiring. It was amazing. Like the work from home channel um, is the most used channel in the whole company. And it's truly amazing because somebody will be like, away from keyboard for the next two hours, I'm making a cake. And it's like, cool. Okay. That's like phenomenal. I've never worked somewhere like that before. Yeah. It's amazing. And you yeah. found it, obviously they found it really productive for their teams. Obviously, it was so it's productive just... because it's like when you're choosing the way that you like to work, you're so much happier. You're yeah. not sitting there going, I've got to be here from nine to five. Um, you know, I get my best work done kind of afternoon to evening. Um, and it really allowed me to do that. So I'd pick up the kids from school and then come back later at night when they'd gone to bed and kind of get this great work time when there was nobody else online and yeah. kind of churn out a few hours. And oh, it was yeah. amazing. I think my most productive time is between like 8 p.m. and 12 p.m. Yeah. Like 12 a.m. Yeah, I, I love that time. There's no one online, as you said. That's exactly it's it. easy to quiet. Yeah. You can lose track of time mm -hmm. at that point in time. And you so. get into flow, which yeah. is so important for work and which you can't do if you're trying to work kind of in this time that doesn't suit you. Yeah. What was the biggest challenge with working remotely then? I mean, you miss out on the office gossip um, and like it sounds quite frivolous, but particularly kind of in a leadership role, you need to know what's going on um, and people will only really talk to you when they're comfortable. And that's really hard to do over Slack. Um, so, you know, you'd kind of do these check ins like, hey, how's things? But I find I did miss out on a lot of the gossip and the kind of hallway conversations. Yeah. Um, so sometimes like something would ha be happening and I'm like, what is going on? And everyone's like, oh yeah, sorry. We all caught, caught up for an hour over there and we've brought you in now. So you miss out on that side of things a little bit. And also you just miss the ability to like turn to a developer and ask a really quick question. Um, cause you can Slack, but our developers would often turn off Slack to concentrate. So then you have to set up a time for a zoom call. And it's like, I actually like literally just want to talk to you for 30 seconds. Yeah. So you can miss out on that side of things. Yeah, so the majority of the team was working remotely there? There was probably a third when I started yeah. um, and down to probably a few of us kind of uh, later on. Like we had a couple of people that moved to New Zealand, a few moved to Melbourne, we had people in Brisbane, in Dubbo, and then two of us over here in Newcastle. Nice. The part that's probably most refreshing is that interviewing, like the interview questions on the way in to the company as well, it's about yeah. like, you know, what are your motivations as opposed to, you know, what are you doing on a day to day? But like, you know, you're working. Mm. Because I think if you get those motivations right, like you'll find a way to make the job work, right? If you've got that right background. Exactly. And that they hired in like a way that I will take with me forever where, you know, they kind of believe that the, the hard skills you can learn, um, you know, maybe not something like JavaScript, but in general, 
if you have the right attitude and the right personality, you will be able to do the job. It might just take you some ramp up time and particularly true of product management. Like if you look at what it makes a good product manager, it's empathy and curiosity. And if you've got those, you can learn any of the kind of tools and, and things that we do. Um, but if you don't have that empathy and curiosity, you're never going to be a good product manager. Yeah. So, yeah, great. there's a great way of hiring, like based on those personalities. Yeah, and I think if you base on personalities as opposed to hard skills to start with, right? Hard skills, like those skills can be learned. Mm -hmm. If you get the right person in there, you can pick them up, and they're going to be the better long term. Yeah, long term employee, right? Exactly. Better to work with. Yeah, exactly. Like our best product manager literally came from owning a bar, and. Yeah wasn't a product manager and he just had because he owns a bar and he would sit there and talk to people all the time so he really understands what motivates people how to you know how to really get the best out of them because he talks to drunk people all day and that made him the best product manager so i love that i love the fact that i got to work with him that was really really good background as you said like that that core skill is just understanding people right yeah understanding people being able to have conversation mm -hmm. um you know if you can tie on top of that and the ability to sort of talk a little bit technical or take that back to a technical team you're done right mm -hmm. like, exactly well he was he actually um developed our entire hardware process because before that we only really worked with with software but his dad kind of taught him hardware when he was a child and he kind of saw this opportunity he's like we should be doing hardware and he kind of pulled in the entire process because that's what he was interested in because he had the right curiosity um, um, yeah it's amazing nice nice what uh what led you down product management route um, so I started off as a front-end developer, um, or actually I'll go back a step. So I started off in tech support in 95 at Aussie Mail, Australia's first ISP. And I literally got the job because I'd heard of the internet and I was a woman um, and I knew how to connect <laughs> the modem. <laughs> it's like, you know what? I'm all for the like the positive discrimination. It's great. So I'd, I'd heard of the internet um, and I was female and it was like a tech support full of guys. Um, so got the role, did tech support for a little while. And then my boss said, do you know how to create a web page? And I was like, no, but I'm sure I can figure it out. And like two days later, I was like, I know HTML. And this is like HTML one. So yeah. it was so simple. Um, so I kind of got into front end web development, did that for maybe five or six years yeah. and then kind of reached the point where it was like, well, this is great just being able to code up what other people want me to do, but I wanted to be the person making the decisions about what it was that we were coding. Yeah. Um, so I got more into the producing side of things, which is kind of what we call product management in the early 2000s, um, and just loved it and have been in there ever since. That's awesome. Yeah. That's, uh, that's a nice background. I remember uh, my early days in recruitment, in tech recruitment, they're like, oh, you're quite technical. I remember <laughs> from my marketing days having to, you know, to use a little bit of HTMLing, you know, customizing some email templates and things mm. like that. I'm like, oh yeah, I can do a little bit of development, right? <laughs> Which you know what's funny is so I I haven't developed since the early yeah. 2000s. So it used to be like tables based yeah. HTML. And like everybody always laughs at me because I'm like, I'm so not technical anymore. I couldn't code to save my life. But HTML emails still use tables based design and for once I can actually use those skills. Oh, it's that's amazing. Right. Yeah. It wasn't until I had my first conversation with an actual <laughs> developer, I was like, how far out of the depth I am? And I was like, oh, what's this C hash sign? And I'm like, oh, I'm in trouble. Here. I do that all the time. I'm like, C sharp, C, yeah. C hash. Uh, that's embarrassing. It was embarrassing. Uh, I've learned a little since then. Uh, that's really interesting. So, Blue Chili, obviously, um, in there, obviously working with a, a number of different companies mm. uh, and that would have given you an opportunity to say like lots of different ideas, especially uh, non-tech co-founders being able to have a conversation with subject matter experts. What's, uh, if you had to say some commonalities between, you know, the people that were successful, is there any commonalities that people that found really good sort of yes. startup founders? So I've, I feel like as product managers, we could see through bootcamp who was going to accelerate the fastest. Um, and it's not so much any one thing, but like we always looked for resilience, coachability, um, and just that real need to solve a particular problem. So, you know, kind of part of that comes, you know, flexibility and the ability to, you know, roll with the punches. So to listen to the data and to sometimes pivot, but also know when you need to stand your ground. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the ones that came in that we could see that straight away, they kind of flew up really high straight away, but it was the ones that were almost there that we spent the most amount of time because you're like oh I can see that this if we could just get it to this point they'll do really well um but it was always kind of a struggle so yeah I kind of think that resilience and just that need to solve a problem um 
you know, it, that's what makes a really, really, truly uh, great founder. Yeah, nice. Uh, I guess it's probably the same for internal teams, right? Like the ability to solve a problem or the ability to sort of see a problem, have a conversation with the right people, understand what are we actually building. Mm. And the technology is just, you know, the enabler, right? Yeah, the, the, the technology could be anything. But, yeah, it, it really is that need of like, well, who are we solving the problem for? And, you know, having that empathy to want to solve it in the first place. And then from a technical perspective, um, you're obviously working with a lot of people that didn't have that technical skills. Is there any key successes that people that you found that, you know, adding that technical capability, is there any key successes in building out the technical team? Um, I mean, the biggest thrill for me was always watching a founder not be scared of technology. So, you know, we dealt with a lot of um, female founders, a lot of women, um, and there was always kind of this attitude, you know, especially growing up in the 80s and going through the 90s, that tech was a thing that boys did and it wasn't what girls did. Girls did marketing and recruitment. Um, and so there's always been this fear of technology that, oh, I don't know how to do it or I'm going to break it. Yeah. Um, and like the, the thing that got me most on board with tech is like it's actually really hard to break things like, well, so saying I've broken many things, but um, just taking away that fear of experimentation. So allowing women to say, hey, I belong here too. Um, and I'm not going to be scared of this thing. I'm just going to ask questions about it. And like knowledge is power. And I feel like a lot of our founders were always a little bit like, they'd be like a little bit embarrassed or ashamed. They'd be like, I'm not technical. I'm not technical. And it took us six months to be like, you need to be technical and you need to be asking these kind of questions. And just watching their empowerment grow from talking to developers and getting answers and suddenly kind of understanding how the bits fit together. Like that was just such a thrill. Sounds like you've had a lot of success then in taking, I guess, non-technical female founders and and educating them and becoming technical. Mm. Um, If we try to try to continue, how do we, how do we encourage more females into technology? It's a, it's a very real problem. Mm. Um, How how can we, in your opinion and your experiences, how do you think we could help? So there's, there's so many pieces to this. Um, there's one piece in particular that I have specifically been looking up with one of my startups, and that's at the job ad stage. Yeah. So language is really, really important. And a lot of ads written for technical roles, um, the people who are writing the ads don't realize there's a lot of bias in the way they write things. And actually, um, you know, the Guitar Center down the road? Yeah. Like two years ago, they put out an ad for a social media marketing person and it was amazing. I was in this uh, group of Newcastle women and it was amazing watching their reaction to the ad because they had a list of like 12 mandatory things that you needed to be the social media marketing manager. And at the end they'd put like, oh, also would be good the ability to sit, uh, shred a sick guitar. And I kind of read that and I was like, yeah, whatever. But women were reading it going, oh, they've asked for like these 12 mandatory things and I've got them, but I can't play guitar. Like I, I shouldn't apply. Or they'd be like, oh, I've only got 11 of the 12. Um, so women read job ads really literally. And so you've got to really think about the things that you think are mandatory for the role. Are they actually mandatory or are they nice to have? Like, it would be great if you have three things that are mandatory, right? Like it, language is so important or even like the, the way they talk about perks. Like, it's like, we do Friday afternoon ping pong and then beers. And that straight away says to me, you're probably a competitive environment where you've got a bunch of dudes playing ping pong. Um, the fact that, you know, you do after work drinks on a Friday as a mother, I can't participate in that. So I'm already knowing that I'll probably be alienated a little bit if I can't join in that. So it's about thinking about how is this job ad going to read for somebody who reads things really literally and, you know, is probably not so confident. Like a guy will read a job ad and it'll have like 12 mandatory things and they'll have one and they're like, yeah, I'm awesome for this job. I'm going to apply. This is not the first time I've heard this. Yeah. yeah. And it says language as well, like ninja. Never ask for a ninja. Never ask for a rock star. Never ask for like a gun. Like just just ask for what you need, you yeah. know. It's like it's people think it's giving personality to the job ad, but it's actually repelling a huge part of the population. I couldn't agree more. And I couldn't agree more on the, the 12 dot points. I, oh, I that's terrible. 12 dot points, I think. Let's, let's, what are the core skills that you need for this role? Mm. Let's pick two or three of them. Yeah. And then most other things can be learned, right? If you get those core skills, right, and the right person, back to your point earlier about your experience at Blue Chili, what are your motivators? If you get those motivators right and those two, three core skills, the rest can be learned um, mm. and you'll find the right person. I think those other eight dot points, uh, they, they just repel people, right? Yeah, um, And you exactly. repel them too early in the 
in the actual job process mm -hmm. as opposed to... And so they're not even getting into the funnel, right? No. They're not applying. It's Correct. only like the really kind of resilient women who are applying. And then you've got, you know, two applications from women and 500 from men. Yeah, as opposed to three dot points, casting it wider. It's mm -hmm. going to take a little bit more work, yes, from the recruiters or the HR's perspective to go, hey, we're going to cast it a little bit wider by increasing two or three dot points and then I actually have some conversations with people, with human beings, funny mm -hmm. enough. Yep. And um, once you have those conversations... You, you can, can see how somebody will fit in. Yeah, right? and whether it be for that role or another role or you have conversation with the hiring manager, it's the same when you're hiring a person. Um, Companies looking for like for like replacements is, mm. you know, it's never a great thing because then you're trying to look for that exact person. Whereas if you if you treat the role, what are we trying to achieve out of this role? Yep. What are the core skills going to allow us to achieve that? And then look at it from that perspective, it's a completely different ball game. Mm. And uh, it's like, where do we want them to be six months from now? Not where do we want them to come in at, but in six because six months is a really long time. Yeah, um, yeah, and you know, the right person can upskill themselves so quickly. If you had to say the second most important thing, if we look past the job ad and encouraging more uh, more females in technology, is it just that you mentioned, mentioned of the boys club part before? Yeah. Is that changing at all, do you think, or no? It's less obvious. So, you know, I've worked in all male teams for most of my career and literally if I wanted to be part of the group, I would sometimes have to go to the strip club and it's like, but I have to do it because I wanted to be one of the boys and fit in. And that it's less obvious now. Um, you know, it's still there. And I think as guys, you know, I went to one of the, the new JavaScript meetups a little while ago and it was funny. I was kind of one of the few females there. <laughs> a dude came up to me and he's like, oh, you're a recruiter. I was like, why would I be a recruiter? Just like, what if I was a Java? I'm not yeah. a JavaScript developer, but what if I was? You know what I mean? It's like that right there, that's alienating. Um, so I think, you know, not requiring women to have a really thick skin, that would be like the perfect world, right? Yeah, 100%. And then also looking at mums as well, looking at mums and being like having some flexibility around work hours and people have to pick up kids and some people do work best at night, right? Mm -hmm. um, having more flexible work arrangements obviously helps attract a, a wider audience and a better market potentially. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I think, you know, once you, once you have some immediate requirements around being in the office from nine to five, mm -hmm. you, you know, you potentially lose some of your best, your best people. Oh, you definitely And do. a lot of those times um, mums can't, can't do that, right? They've mm -hmm. got children in, in school or in daycare exactly. and other responsibilities and, yeah, more flexible work arrangements, I think. Yeah, probably. that's a huge one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you think overall we're heading in a better direction? It's funny. It's It swings and roundabouts. I feel like work-wise... Yes, absolutely. Like, you know, I know lots of people hate the idea of quotas. Um, you know, I don't work for somewhere where we have a quota, but we definitely have positive discrimination when it comes to recruitment because we will um, try and give every chance to the women who are applying and, you know, really go through the resume. And, and we would generally interview most of them um, that came through the process. So work-wise, yes. And then you jump on Twitter and it's like, oh, God, <laughs> like, I feel like we're sure. going backwards. <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, I, I don't know if you saw this one like last week where one of uh, some like startup founder in America was saying that he would had gone through seven interviews and then he was told as a white male, he'll never get the role because, you know, women and, and people of color are, um, will get the role over him. And it was just this absolute like eye opening thing of like, he actually genuinely believes that by giving other people an equal chance and maybe someone who might be more qualified than him will get the role, he sees that as discrimination. So it's like, I feel like we're going forward and then we're also going backwards. So. Yeah, there's always those people out there, right? Mm. And then they, you start the commentary on the back of that and then snowballs and yeah, yeah it's not, a, not an enjoyable conversation. Maybe. Yeah, well, it's funny how for, for people who have been, you know, the, the top of the pyramid for so long, like equality feels like discrimination to them. But it's like that's only because you've been up there the whole time. Yeah, it's terrible, so. right? Mm. Yeah, I never thought of it. Yeah, that's yeah, it's not great. Mm. But I think if the more and more conversations that I had around that topic, um, the more and more people become aware. We can help educate, and then as you said, there's a couple of tips you put there about even just improving the the hiring process. If we're going to do that, mm -hmm. at least helps more people get into that final, have that conversation. The more people are in roles that can encourage others into the role as well, because I know there are a lot of people 
for meetups, for example, if, uh, a lot of females won't go to a meetup if there's no other females. But they look mm. at an attendance list and it's all males. You know, mm-hmm. there's a barrier to entry there. Whereas if there's at least some other people there, you know, it becomes other females there. It becomes you know more inviting. And it's the same with going into a work team. Exactly. Uh, if you go into, if you have a look at the rest of the team, you're being introduced to the rest of the team. They're all pale white male. Mm-hmm. Um, what does that tell you about you know diversity or how they? how they employ in general. Yeah, and it's interesting. I've been kind of looking at other roles um, recently and pretty much all of them, when I ask about like, well, who's on the C-suite, it's, you know, if there's seven people, at least six of them are men in their 30s and 40s, right? And it's like, why? It's not like there's not more qualified women. It's just that's just the way it is. Um, So I think, you know, and I am the kind of the agitator where I'm like, oh, what does that say to you? And everyone's like, yes, we know we need to do more about diversity. And and people do. Um, But, yeah, it's it's kind of slow going. Agreed. Mm. Agreed. So you've been in Newcastle, you mentioned it for three years now. What brought you to Newcastle? Uh, So I was living in the U.S. So I went over there to start a startup um, with one of the guys I knew in the industry. So I was there for kind of eight years. Um, Trump got voted in. I had a very knee-jerk reaction because I was there the entire time Obama was in and it was like this hopeful, kind of beautiful, optimistic time. And then Trump got voted in. Like a week later, racist graffiti appeared in our neighborhood. Like it got ugly really, really quickly, like within a week. Um, I had a very knee-jerk reaction and I was like, okay, we've got to go back to Australia. And I looked up... um, it, I looked up a, a four-bedroom place in Bondi where you could walk to the beach and I was like, oh, that's really not bad. Like, it's only 3200 a month to, for this place. Like, we should move. And then uh, I realized, okay, that's the weekly price. <laughs> I'm not going to get a four-bedroom place in Bondi anytime soon. Um, and we had some friends that lived in Newcastle and, um, yeah, it just seemed like a great lifestyle for kids. And I actually had a role um at Newcastle permanent um that I got before I moved back but I I didn't last very long there so uh yeah kind of came back and then found my feet and kind of found my tribe yes nice lots about finding your tribe right yeah and what's your experience obviously you've been working for Blue Chile they're based in Sydney you've been working remotely Mm -hmm. but what's your experience or uh experience like with the Newcastle tech scene do you have any sort of indication on whether you think Oh, we've got a strong or a growing tech scene here. You do. It's definitely growing. I mean, I think what Siobhan is doing down at like the I2N yeah. is really amazing. Like I go to so many meetups that she puts on, you know, Newcastle Council, like in Sydney, everybody talks about Newcastle Council being so like forward thinking and, you know, you've got new Ventures who I've introduced to people in Sydney because I think they're doing more amazing work than a lot of people He's in Sydney are. Great guy, yeah. You know, we've just got the new Melt workspace um, so it's really small. Um, you know, I'll go to a meetup in Sydney and there's 300 people and I come here and there's like seven. Yeah. <laughs> but at least like the same people are going. So I think it, it really is like a really great community up here. I would just love to see a couple more big companies from Sydney actually move out here and kind of force everybody's hand. Because, yeah. you know. I think that there's two ways, right? I think it's that the easiest way and the best way I think is for a, a large company or two to to move here and bring you know build a team here mm. the other way unfortunately not unfortunately but the slower grind is a company locally build build up and grow here and mm. you know hit some real success maybe one of the scale ups you know taking off to that next level and building a team here i mm. think it's a lot the quick win would be to try to encourage a bigger company to move here um build their team um it yeah. definitely help because it's that sort of chicken and egg scenario where i think two years ago there might not have been the jobs here so people in yep. the tech community moved away mm-hmm. um, those jobs are now here um, and they're growing and growing and you know we don't have that talent pool here because a lot of people have moved away but they're starting to attract people back because there are more opportunity around and you don't have to go to sydney yeah and it's funny everybody i know in sydney wants to get out of sydney as well yeah. it's like i kind of look at it and i'm like you've got this amazing tech scene there you've got you know so many jobs but everyone's like Everyone I know is trying to get out of Sydney. So yeah. I think if there were to be some big companies that moved up here, I think it would also be really easy to convince a lot of people in Sydney to move up here too. Yeah. Um, and what do you think we could do to help build the local community up here in Newcastle? Like obviously you've seen a lot of successes in Sydney, 300 people going to meetups. Obviously part of that is population. But mm-hmm. is there anything you think we could be doing better in Newcastle to help build the tech community? Um, 
I mean, I think the meetups you guys do are great. It'd probably be good to get more like bigger speakers coming up here. Like I feel like to go to a good conference or to listen to somebody kind of talk through something I don't know, even though that sounds really arrogant. Um, you probably need to bring different speakers up here because I feel like we get a lot of Newcastle speakers, which is great to understand what they're doing, but it'd be good to kind of get other perspectives as well, like someone where you're like, oh, my God, I've followed this person for, you know, years. I yeah. can't wait to hear them speak. Yeah. Um, but then I guess that's a budget thing as well. Yeah, it is. It is. But it's it's also nice to have it as an objective as well to say, hey, mm. let's, you know, that is what the next stage of growth looks like, right? Is yeah, to say, it's like hey, bring up like the Jared Spools of the world or like, you know, even people from overseas. Yeah. Um, and Sydney's not too far to go to, uh, you know, to pull yeah. some, you know, reasonable size speakers up here as well. Yeah. Like I think, you know, if you get like Cameron from Canva up here, you'd get a lot of people coming to hear him. Oh, um, yeah. You know, so I yeah, completely. start start asking for those speakers to come on up. It's yeah. only two hours on the train. No, that's exactly right. <laughs> exactly right. I'm sure hey, we'll find the budget if necessary, right? Mm. Um, local recruiters might throw their hand in their pocket. <laughs> <laughs> um, is the biggest challenge for us just in Newcastle being the size, do you think? I think it's the size. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. I agree. As that continues to grow, uh, it does have a bit of a snowball effect. I think, as you said, there is a core group that goes to a lot of the meetups and, mm. you know, if we start to add more and more onto that, um, I think, yeah, it can have a little bit of a snowball effect, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And stuff like the trivia night, I mean, it's awesome, right? You get everybody yeah. in the room and it's like everyone has a great time. Yeah. Um, and that kind of really builds a whole community as well. Yeah, I completely agree. Completely agree. Mm -hmm. um, let's spin it a little bit more about yourself. Um, previous discussions we've had, you're partway through an MBA. Mm -hmm. What what made the decision to go down that route? Um, so I went straight from high school into working for Aussie Mail. Yeah. Um, I uh, deferred uni for a year, which I'm really glad I did because I was going to study theatre. <laughs> <Like, laughs> right. <laughs> so it'd be like. A taxi driver after that um <laughs> so i, I kind of now. deferred for a year i worked i found i loved working um so i did aussie mail for like three years and then i went to europe and worked in london um and i found having three years experience in html by that point i was really really employable like people were like throwing jobs and money at me um and then I kind of reached a point when I turned 28 or so where I'd had, you know, 10 years experience in the industry. And, you know, I, I got the great jobs because I had so much more experience than everyone else. But then people who had gone to uni started to catch up because 10 years to seven years is much of a muchness. And then as I was starting to look at roles in my 30s, everybody was like, you don't have a degree. Oh, like, like Google. Yeah. Like I had an interview with Google um, and I mentioned, I was like, oh, I, I didn't get a degree, but, you know, I've got like 15 years experience at this point. And he goes, by your age, I'd expect you have a PhD. Oh, wow. <laughs> and it's like, all right, I think we're done here. Um, but I did start to really feel that gap of, um, you know, once I had a certain level of experience, people were looking for certain things for certain roles. And I thought if I needed if I wanted to get into leadership, I really needed something behind me. I didn't want to go back and get an undergrad. Um, and an MBA seemed like a really good path. And so far, it's been really interesting. Um, it's the MBA in digital transformation, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's been really fascinating. Um, it's been a little bit frustrating as well because, like, I'm such a nerd that I'm sitting there, like, doing all of my assignments early and, like, really putting a lot of effort into it. Um, and the particular degree I'm doing has a lot of international students and I swear half of them don't even read the question <laughs> and then they're just kind of typing away these essays and we have to do peer marking and that's frustrating, but, you know, it is what it is. So that's a challenge. Mm. And the biggest benefit of it so far has just been that digging in. It's the piece of paper, honestly. It's yeah. like the learning is good and just kind of the structured learning Um has been interesting. I mean, I, I'm going to be really arrogant for a second and just say I don't think I've learned anything I didn't necessarily know already. Mm -hmm. um, but hopefully we will get to that point where, you know, maybe it's all around like budgeting and financing and yeah. stuff that I don't do at the moment. Is there other forms of education you found along your career that you found really beneficial? Um, I love conferences and yeah. it's not necessarily so much for the hands-on this is how you do this, but like really surfacing new concepts for me. Um, so I just went to the Web Directions conference. I was actually speaking at it um, in November 
And, you know, the, the keynoter is a woman that works in wearables. And it's just this, she gave this really fascinating take about wearables and all of the things you need to think about yeah. as far as like future of human interaction uh, with our clothing goes. And so that stuff is really fascinating because it gives me this area that I want to dive down deeper on. Um, or, you know, you had Mark Pesci talking about the future of money and talking about like the digital one coming in in China and how that's going to change like the future of economics. So I love stuff like that because it's not necessarily like hands on learning, um, but just these big concepts that have never occurred to me where it's like, oh, wow, like I had never thought in that direction and now I want to learn more. So, yeah, yeah I love conferences for that. Nice. Mm. And then obviously taking that away and you can deep dive into those topics as well. Mm, yeah. Nice. Is there any other forms of education you found along your path? Any? Um... So I'm a big book reader. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so many of the business books I read. Um, I'm quite lucky um, that I retain books really easily. So, like, that's my form of learning. Yeah, nice. Um, so Is there I find any books I can... that you'd recommend to people? Um... Are they? Do you know what? The, the best one I've read lately is one called Creative Selection by Ken Concieda, who yeah. used to be a developer for Apple. Yeah. So he was one of the um, developers that worked on Safari. So he's kind of talking through how you actually make a browser and it's kind of going through the DOM and like really mm -hmm. fascinating. And then he ended up um, being the engineer on the iOS keyboard. Yeah, right. And he's kind of talking through all of the different interaction patterns that he tried on the way to getting the keyboard as we know it. So wow. that was like the best book because that sounds like it should be really boring, but yeah. it's actually really fascinating. Nice. Yeah. Is there any other books you'd recommend that you've read along, along your years? That you I mean, there's a lot of the, um, so like the Lean Product Playbook, um, all of the kind of early startup books, all of the product management kind of side of things. Yeah. Yeah. There. Yeah, your traditional ones. There. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Is there any other forms of education you use outside of books? Do you listen to podcasts or? Listen to a lot of podcasts on yeah. my drives to Sydney. Mm -hmm. um, they're not necessarily education, but my favorite one is called The Pitch from Gimlet Media. Yeah. Um, so basically you get a startup founder pitching real investors. And that has been really eye opening in terms of like, I'm a product person. So I always thought that it was like the product should stand alone and that's what people should be believing in. Yeah. But actually there's this whole other piece to it where it's actually, it's all about sales and marketing. It's about like what the investors are looking for in a startup. Uh, so I think I've listened to every single episode of that and um, really great education for looking at what investors are actually going to do a deep dive on and like how important it is that they really like you as a founder as well. Yeah, learning through other people's stories as opposed to being, you know, told here's a theory. It's, yeah. It's, I find that an easier way to learn as well, right? I yeah, like, absolutely. love bi biographies, but Gimlet have just nailed the podcast. Space, oh, they do. They? Amazing. Oh, my Lord. Like they have not had a dud yet. No. No, mm. they just keep nailing it. They've yeah. and they jumped on early as well. And then, yeah, well, so, now Spotify yeah. owned them for what, like $8 billion or something it's ridiculous. Phenomenal <laughs> amount of money. Um, <laughs> phenomenal amount of money. Yeah. But, and sort of, yeah, to their credit, they haven't yeah. killed it yet either. Like, uh, it hasn't, hasn't changed to yeah, have a negative effect or anything like that. No, I mean, I think just the money is going to be better for them. Them and Radiotopia. So, Roman Mars is my other favorite podcast yeah, nice. guy. Awesome. Um, is there any other people you follow on Twitter? You mentioned Twitter before, or pe blogs that you follow that you f people that you think, hey, if I wanted to get into product management or wider, that yeah, there's quite a few in product management. So there's uh, John Maida um, and John Cutler. They're both pretty amazing to follow. Like my Twitter is basically like diversity and inclusion people, feminists and product managers. So. <laughs> That's a nice free-prong attack. But they're actually, funnily enough, they're all really related. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, I mean, Aubrey Blanche is really amazing to follow on Twitter. Uh, Cindy Gallup is like, you know, she's my absolute idol. I think she's an incredible woman, so she's worth following too. Yeah, we'll link all them up in the show notes as well. So, oh, awesome. So people can follow them. Yep, for sure. Nice. Um, Last question I've got. If you had to wind it back and give yourself some advice, a, a younger version of Cheryl, what would you, what advice would you give? So this is probably going to come off as negative advice, but I was really shocked that when I had kids, what an impact it had on my career. Like I always thought like, you know, kind of growing up with like in the nineties, girl power, riot girls, like we can do anything. And then you have kids and then you realize that even though 
I think I can do everything, other people don't. And so my career took a massive backward step when I had kids, not through kind of a choice of mine. Um, and it's taken, you know, a number of years to build back up to the level I was before I had kids. And even now, I guess you have to make choices based on having kids rather than what you want to do. And like that should be really obvious to everybody before you have kids. But I, it never really occurred to me that like I'm like, oh, you know, like a year or two, you take time out and then you come back and you kind of do what you were doing. Um, but I was really surprised how that wasn't the case. And all of my friends are in equally surprised positions where we're all like, did nobody tell us that this would be the way? And you, people do tell you, but you don't realize until you're in it. Um, yeah. And I would love to see that change. I would love to see women be able to have kids, you know, 20 years from now and come back in at the level they left at and it not be a thing. And they can just do different hours or they can have more flexible working because our brains don't change. Just yeah. the way we like to work changes. Um, so I would love to see that not an issue, but I was really surprised that it was. So I would just warn myself, um, hey, this is going to happen. Just kind of be prepared for it. Yeah. Um, and after the warning... Do you think that so to help other people in that same scenario at the moment, obviously you could warn them that this is going to happen. Is there any advice you give them? I mean, I would say if you can stay in part-time in the role you're in, even though it would be really hard kind of over that first year, I would definitely do that. Um, I mean, it should be everybody agitating for this, like agitating for different ways of working and everything else. Yeah, I don't know that I necessarily have advice because, you know, I was probably given the same advice, which I ignored because I thought it didn't apply to me. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I guess, yeah, either just kind of be ready for it to happen and be ready for a slow ramp up when you come back or, you know, kind of try and stay in a role at that level for a while um, and doing it part time. Yeah, that's very real. That's a very, very real mm. um, problem and issue still is that... Uh, that lack of flexibility on the hiring part into mm. the types of people you hire into your team. Yeah. Um, well, I was literally just asked like two years ago uh, when I was going for the role. It was three years ago because I was in America. Um, and I'd mentioned the kids in my interview. And I know you're not supposed to, but my theory is I shouldn't have to hide the fact that I have kids. Like it shouldn't be something that I'm penalized on. Um, but I had the, the interviewer go, well, what's going to happen to the kids if you get this job? And I'm like, Nobody has ever asked my husband that in no. an interview. So why are you asking me? Like, we'll sort it. And why is it my responsibility? Um, and that still happens, which, you know, that was what I was really surprised by, that that still happens. I kind of thought that was back, you know, five, ten years ago. But it's it still happens. Yeah, it's not allowed to happen. But, mm, it, happens, but it does. Right? Yep. Yeah. And even if it's not as direct as that, it's... Mm asked sometimes in a roundabout way maybe yep. not as direct as that was all the, the conversations US. happen behind closed doors of like oh well yeah we, we could give her this role but is she just going to leave on maternity leave or you know is she going to have to leave early to pick up the kids and all of that and it's seen as a as a negative thing yeah as opposed to um the positivity the different experiences that someone like yourself could bring to a team mm. Or the fact that I get so much work done between eight and ten at night like yeah. so much more than I would between you know Eight and ten in the morning. Yeah, I, I, I could not agree more. And I think, yeah, I think as much as people talk about things have changed, things mm. are still very slow to change, and it hasn't changed as a whole as mm. yet. I think that's across many different factors, but mm. mums included. Um, first, no, not first, second hand experience at home. My mm. wife's gone through a similar scenario, and it's just it's a different experience going back in and then that slow grind back in and. Mm. very very real problem still yeah and i think you know guys have to be part of the solution here too because women can kick and scream and yell and rant and rave um but it does kind of take men who see it like you've seen it now and now you can kind of start calling it out when you see it yeah. which you know it kind of takes being really aware of it yeah um, awareness yeah. is i guess the first the first stage of that journey right i guess mm. you awareness before people can take action they've got to become aware of it mm. um it's still slow. Yeah, it is. It's still slow. Oh, I'm glad you brought that up. It's uh, a topic that hasn't been brought up on this podcast yet, but it's mm. a very real, a very, very real problem mm. um, and a very real problem for a reasonable percentage of, you know. Or of, half the population, yeah. right? Yeah. And this is the problem is like, you know, so many of the, like the top 500 companies have this 40, 40, 20 diversity targets where they went 40% men, 40% women and kind of 20% other. 
But at the upper management level, they're not finding the 40% women because they're leaving the workforce because they can't find, you know, flexible work or they're having to go back to square one. So, you know, if companies are serious about these targets too, like things need to change. I couldn't agree more. I really appreciate you bringing that up. Uh, It's great. That's a good topic to have on the podcast. It's a good topic to start to actually, you know, share out there. And hopefully more people that become aware of it, the more people can actually start to put these small actions in place to help change things, right? Yeah. And you're a recruiter, right? So you can be educating companies who think that they need 40 hours bums in seats. It's like, actually, you don't. Yeah. That's definitely part of my role, right? Um, And part of the responsibility I have in the community and in in trying to help educate employers. and all, all employees are at different stages. Some are great um, and some are whatever the opposite of great is. <laughs> um, and looking at these things, right? Um, so, yeah, I think education is a very real part there and I definitely take that on as you know, a responsibility of, of a recruiter within the market. Mm. Thank you. And thanks for coming in today. Yeah, no I really problem. appreciate it. Cool, it's great to Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks.